<clears throat> when you think about childbirth, what fears come up for you? Fear of childbirth is growing all around the world rather than diminishing as our medical model often gives people a false sense of safety, yet an increased sense of fear. Hi, I'm Deborah Pascali Bonaro, host of the Orgasmic Birth Podcast, and I am joined today by a very special guest, and she's going to provide you with some tips to overcoming fear and also insights on breech birth. Betty Ann Davis has been a midwife for 47 years on various continents and a researcher in the social sciences and clinical epidemiology for 30 years. She cites learning from traditional midwives from Guatemala to Afghanistan as one of the highlights of her career. While acting as a project coordinator for the Safe Motherhood Initiative of FIGO in 2004, the follow-up to the term breach trial was published, and she switched focus to search across Europe for the best breach practices. She has provided lectures in China, India, Africa, and Latin America on human rights and childbirth, using the return to breach as one model solution. Working between Ottawa and Frankfurt in 2008 to 2016, she became the co-principal investigator and principal writer for the Frankfurt study comparing vaginal breaches born with the mother upright versus on their back, and co-authored other articles with the Frankfurt team on twins and MRIs in the breach. Her manual, Rethinking the Physiology of Vaginal Breach Birth, describes vaginal breach history, new maneuvers of upright breach, and the research to support them. She is the principal editor of a recently published book that I highly recommend both of these, Birthing Models on the Human Rights Frontier, Speaking Truth to Power, a Colorful Combined Activist, academic treaties on social justice issues. She has more recently traveled to the Ukraine to teach emergency skills to doctors and midwives from the front lines. And she's here in Bali with me after we both attended the International Confederation of Midwives meeting. And she came yesterday to teach the midwives at Ibu Robin's Bumi Sehat Clinic, as well as to share at our Eat, Pray, Doula retreat. And I am so honored to welcome you, Betty Ann. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all your wisdom. Well, thanks, Deborah. I just so everybody realizes I've got a bit of a, I've talked for six hours straight yesterday and losing my voice. So much wisdom too. I have to tell you that every person was hanging on every word. So they've really been enjoying and getting so much wisdom as I know you will too. So I just want to pick up on something you said because I because I think it's really important and and it's about fear and um and I I know that when you first said uh, you wanted to do a podcast you said well uh, uh, do you, do you want to do it about breach I said well I actually want to do it about fear and you said yeah but you're not a an expert on fear you're an expert on breach and I thought well after 47 years of being a midwife where I've been I have some expertise in fear in in overcoming fear anyway. <laughs> And, and that's probably because my career started off when an earthquake hit. I was in Guatemala and I was dealing with, you know, how to, how to, how to rum, rummage around the rubble, trying to get people out and, and trying to figure out how we could rebuild our village. And then I spent time in Afghanistan. I had to work with a Taliban judge who really did not like us. And we were trying to start a girls' school and uh, also teach the traditional midwives who he had no respect for it whatsoever. He did by the end of the project, by the way. Um, and I've had to deal well, and, and re I've also been working in worked in Nicaragua in 1987, where we were dealing with the changeover with the the Sandinista taking over from after Somoza had been deposed. So it's always been in political situations. I've been working outside of Canada, um, and, and then of course Ukraine, um, teaching with the people from the front. Um, and my husband is a little reticent to have me go to Ukraine, but he's recently come with me. It's great. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. So, but what's really funny about all of that is I did not fear in most of those situations. I just overcame. I thought, okay, well, if I'm, if I'm killed in any of these situations that it was meant to be. Um, but the, the biggest fear I have actually is not in any of those countries. It's in dealing with my own colleagues back home 
who might have a less a more conservative take on what I do, um, because I was, for instance, in 2006, um, uh, one of the midwives from a very conservative place in Ontario, who didn't really believe in be back at home, did, thought water, water worth birth was dangerous, and was highly suspicious of me offering breach to people, because she didn't think we should continue doing breach, even after the term breach trial. She um, became the head of complaints and disciplines and tried to take me down. It took me six years to fight what was going on. And fortunately, I was backed by my entire community. My entire community came out in support of me. They wrote to the Association of Ontario Midwives. Um, and, and we started to get backing. And I realized, I think you can almost overcome any bit of fear by asking your community for help. And I think that that's what I've always done. It's always worked. And I also just wanted to talk a little bit about fear and obstetrics, because it really comes from a larger based problem. It's, it's, it's really about the language of risk. And the language of risk is something that has actually panned across all kinds of other disciplines. It's not just in childbirth, even the, the language of risk for um, seafaring people going off into uh, trying to figure out whether or not they're going to go off into their boats. And apparently the sociologists tell us that it was in the 1990s that things started to switch around the language of risk. And now I'm talking also about the language of um, um, uh, playgrounds. You know, you remember when we used to be able to be in playgrounds as young kids, and we were allowed to go up to high monkey bars. And part of the risk was you might fall on that hard pavement down below. Well, they have eliminated all that. So they've eliminated so many things that we don't, we're not permitted to take risks anymore. And our society is starting to teach us we're not supposed to take any risks. But the risks that they decide are risks are usually not that risky. And so one of the things that happened around the language of risk is that they used to look at risk from a historical standpoint. So they'd look at the history and they go, okay, what is the risk when we've had waters this stormy in the past? What is our risk if we go out? And if it was 5%, it'd take it, right? Right. Now, instead in childbearing, in seafaring, instead, Everybody focuses on the one worst case scenario. <laughs> and it becomes a real problem because it for breach, it's the, oh my God, what if you have the stuck head? And and the stuck head business, what I've realized working with um the, the, the people I've been working with is we don't have stuck heads. We have, especially if you're if you're doing the birth in the upright position, if you're using the maneuvers that we've developed, not forceps then we've been able to overcome all those risks. So I just wanted to start off by saying that, that this language of risk is a societal thing. It's not just um, us dealing with it in childbearing. So the other thing I wanted to talk about um, along the, the fear thing, not the breach thing, <laughs> okay, um, was the, the definitions of risk and what they say fear is. And what they say is um, fear is dealt with in our amygdala and deep in our brain. and one of the things that happens when you become overcome by fear is the amygdala can't control the emotions that are developed around. And when I have spoken, I've gone through a lot of um, heads of obstetrics in two hospitals where I had privileges. And the first one I ever had said to me, I brought up breach. He said, oh, that's just an emotional issue. And I, he named it. And it was really good that he named it. And he knew himself that it was totally irrational um, because at that time, the term breach trial, trial hadn't even come out. But I, I realized that, that everybody knows it's there and it's an unnamed thing. So the fear of breach is affecting everybody today. The fear of breach, it's affecting normal childbirth as well. That's why I use breach as an example of how even though it is probably one of the uh, real major problems in obstetrics, it also holds all the solutions to get over our fear. And I have thought um, for some time about 
where the fear is coming from. I, I, but I want to talk first address um, the fear that that parents have. That the mother and childbearing person is often confronted with this because she's going all over the web. But it's also especially from her parents or her aunt or her uncle who is an obstetric uh, obstetrician. Or it, and, and when she's met with all these fears, she, she walked into it um, possibly thinking it was just a, an, a variation of the norm. But no, it becomes worse than that. And it's our society's take on it. It's not really something which um, she should have to confront. It's quite unfair, the, the fear that's built up around this. Then there's the fear of the practitioners. And the practitioners basically have the same fear that I mentioned at the beginning, which is fear of being taken down by their colleagues, fear of their community. Even when the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists uh, changed their protocols to go back to offering breach, the docs on the ground didn't want to pick up on it. Why? Because even though they are governed by their, their guidelines of their Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they're actually more concerned about their colleagues who are right in their own hometown. And if one or two colleagues say, oh, you don't want to get involved with that, they're going to get involved. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately uh, is virtual reality and using virtual reality, those big wow. big things that people put on, on their faces, like you, because they've used virtual reality to help, for instance, an example of how they've used it for healing is they've put these machines on people who have a fear of heights and then they take them into places where they, they know that it's not real. It, they know it's virtual. So a, an example is one woman who was afraid of going down an escalator. They put these, these, um, these machine on her. And then they had her starting on the escalator, but actually jumping off onto a whale sitting in the shopping center. Um, and then doing ridiculous things like that. And when it actually came time for her to then try and, going down the escalator without the virtual reality headdress on. She didn't think it was going to work, but it did. So in discussing how to get over fear in all of these scenarios in obstetrics, especially the breach right now, I thought, well, we have a kind of virtual reality. We try to get, we give people the knowledge I have four hour seminars with my clients and I have them see videos, normal videos of the breach. I have them also see videos where the breach is not taking the cardinal movements as it's coming through the birth canal. And I say, okay, this is what we do in this situation. I also tell them, I give them the worst case scenario. What if your baby dies? But I show, I say, well, you know, that's true of head down or breach. And quite frankly, the, the data that we have right now, the death, the possible death, if you're having a head down baby, is between about 0.5 and 1 per thousand, okay? Well, it's only about, uh, if you have a section, they say it's zero in some places, but really it's about 0.8. Say if you have a vaginal birth, it's about 0.8 to 1.7. But these are all very small, minute amounts and if you put them on a graph, you realize it's a tiny little thing way up there that you can almost barely see in the middle of all the other thousand blocks. And so I say to people, okay, if you're afraid of your baby dying, which is highly unlikely, uh, or having a long-term negative sequela, just go with that fear and say, okay, that's the worst case scenario. Uh, or your baby having a low apgar, I'm say. You're gonna, your baby's probably going to have a low APGAR if you've got a breech birth and it comes vaginally. So if you don't have a low APGAR, you, you count your blessings. You, you go to the worst case scenario if you want to. But quite frankly, I can't live my life that way. Like as a practitioner, I can't, like, like what I found in this thing about the worst case scenario and in obstetrics today is the obstetricians seem to look at the mother and they go, they don't do that, first of all. First, they don't <laughs> touch you. That's for sure, right? Um, they they seem to consider clients to be their source of, of litigation. Yes. And it's really hard when you're trying to have a human a humanistic birth to have, if you've got that at the back of your mind, that's what you want to undo right. in the obstetrician's mind. How do we get there? 
And I don't think I'm the way you change any human behavior is you have to first help them to understand that they have a problem. The obstetricians don't think they have a problem. A lot of the midwives don't think they have a problem. A lot of the nurses don't think they have a problem. I think you and I think that we have a problem. Yes. And so we have to get that to that point. One of my favorite skits in Saturday Night Live once was when they had they had a skit of um, about people coming together for a sensitivity session, and there were people that had bad haircuts. And so people were approaching, and they'd have these wild like, shh, shh, you know, <laughs> I don't know, way out of nowhere. And then this one guy comes to deliver his mother. And he's got this, he's got one half of his head shaved and the other half, there's a little braid around it here. And he arrives and he approaches the group and they, he, they, say, they look at him to sit down. He goes, oh, no, 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 I'm not coming to this group. It, I'm bringing my mother. And they all continue to look. At him. It's because he's not admitting he's got a bad haircut, right? And the motto of the group was, it will always grow out. And I would really like to suggest that we <laughs> try to get to the point where we can help people get through concepts of normal birth and try to look at the breach uh, right now and the way people are viewing the breach as a bad haircut. And it will always grow out. And we need to get to that point where we can help it to grow out. <laughs> Be, or else we can accept the bad haircut and think, well, we're going to have a bad haircut. But let's not think of it as something that has a real, that we have to use the language of risk all the time. Yeah, I agree with you so much. And yeah, take a sip because one, I'm sure for everybody listening, you know, just I hearing you, you know, in not having fear in the places you've gone and the I would say from fear to courage, right? Like how you face those fears in your own life and being able to provide care and teach people in places that so needed that support on the front lines. But also I love how you're talking about our culture of risk, right? That our providers live in and that that passes down to all of us. So as we're thinking, and I know that people listening are Many of you may be some providers. Um, many of you are preparing for your birth. So what are some ways, like I love the Saturday Night Live skit. I have to say, I'm going to be Googling it. Many, Maybe some of you will, but looking at how can we normalize that? How can we look at breach and all variations in birth as normal? And I'm going to just add this. I have twin grandsons. And they were born vaginally. And my second one born, Xander, came out feet first. So personally, I was blessed to have caregivers that really overcame their fear and also were very skilled in New Jersey. My midwife, shout out to Lonnie Morris um, and Dr. Haddad, who felt comfortable. But I know that they're, in, at least in my region, they're kind of a rare ones that have that experience. So what other ways can people access both providers that both support breach, but also how do we minimize fear? So again, what we have to do is we have to look at fear and fear, our biggest fear is that we're going to make a big mistake and we're going to mess up. And then we're not going to be loved by our peers and they're going to cancel us with the cancel culture going on. Um, and I had to give up on that long ago. I thought, okay. And I even know one of my very good colleagues is somebody who did breaches with me. She had done 10 breaches with me, 13 breaches with me. And then we had an outcome where our baby had to go to the NICU. Now the baby's fine. The baby's fine today. But it really brought up all of the fears she'd always had. And she quit. She said, Betty Ann, I want people to like me. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do breaches anymore because I want people to like me. And, and I know um, I know in Australia, I just found out that, that in Melbourne, they had a bad outcome and they closed down the whole unit. And so what we've got to do, they wouldn't close down the whole unit if they had a baby death with a cephalic baby. No. And so you've got to look at this and, and you've got to think about it in terms of, of relative risk, right? Um, and as a person steeped in 
uh, living with an epidemiologist talking about relative risk all the time and odds ratios, I'm constantly thinking about that. And so this is the quote I love best. It comes from Zig Ziglar, who's, who's one of these people who does a lot of, um, um, uh, he, he writes books about um, getting over problems and how to organize your life so that you are more successful. And he has this great quote that says, well, there are two ways to deal with fear. One is to forget everything and run. And the other one is to face everything and rise. And I think it is such a wonderful thing to do. And if you don't do it, then you realize that you haven't faced your fear and it's going to come up again. And uh, I'm going to get to some stuff about the breach, but there are all the, 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 this basic thing, it's really important. And I don't think that, um, maybe I won't mention her by name, but one of the midwives in South America for whom I had to testify because she had lost a baby. And the baby, they, it turned out, died of an anomaly. There was a problem with the cord. But because of what happened to them, but she and two colleagues, they she really wanted to, she was a very strong political person. She really wanted to take this further. And I said, look, we're going to use this book. We're going to use the basis of this book, which is about using the human rights platform now, what the book suggests is we've, we're going to move away from our disenfranchised social movements. We're going to move onto the platform of human rights. And I can try to help you take you to the point where in your country, you don't have to think about doing home births all the time because the doctors decide to take up the banner and start doing offering vaginal breaches in a hospital. And it's a human right to have that Let's take this to the court. Let's take this to the higher court in your country. And she was ready to do it, but the other two midwives weren't ready to do it. And because they didn't do it, guess what's happened? First of all, they had to stop practicing for a year. The other thing that's happened is they're really trying to take down home birth just generally now in their country. So if we don't face up to those fears at the beginning, when in the budding of the problems, if we don't face it, and force it, and force the issue, we are going to allow that to continue on. And it's just like Greta Thunberg and her um, sitting outside the Swedish parliament to try to force the issue. It's got to be forced, or we're not going to save normal birth. We've got to do it. And midwives and doulas tend to not like confrontation. We tend to like to be people that and I don't say, I mean, as a midwife, they always accuse me of just lighting candles. Excuse me. I do emergency skills workshop all over the world. And I, I know what it's like to be in a war zone. I know what it's like to have to deal with the manual removal of a placenta. I know what it's like to have a baby that's not um, breathing and you have to resuscitate. But I think we tend to shy away from these things. And I think we should always bring them. Yes. I think that's the most important thing to do when you're facing your fear is bring them up. So something happens in your hospital. Our latest one is physicians don't want us to do births on the floor, meaning like really, <laughs> right? We've always done births on the floor. And I, part of it for me is I can just take on so many things, right? That's right. part of it. It's also always so much time and day. I'm already dealing with the breach. I'm trying to deal now with um, not cutting the cord like a half a minute after the birth. Right. Like we, like when we do bur breach births in our hospital and I, and I, I won the right to do it in 2013 from a very benevolent head of obstetrics who, who, who was tired of me writing from Frankfurt saying, damn, we've got a really good birth this today. I, and it was, and it was uh, like the foot came first, but it's okay. We did a little fundal pressure and the baby came out and the baby had a few, you know, wisps of oxygen was fine. And I kept writing him constantly. And he finally said, okay, Okay, it's okay. You don't have to show me all the data. I'll give you the privileges. Let's go with it. Because he found that his younger physicians were not doing what he thought they should be doing. He did breaches. And this, this wonderful man, his name is Dan Monroe. I will mention him by name because I we, he's considered in our hospital an hero dans notre hospital. I work in a French hospital in Canada. And, 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 uh, and since that time, we've had... Um, 
uh, basically I've been tolerated, but I haven't felt the same enthusiasm from the physicians as when we first started doing this. And it's not, um, we have had bad in our hospital. We have had, the only damage I've seen actually is from forceps. We've had babies that have had, um, uh, been in the NICU, we definitely have, but the long-term negative sequela from these births does not seem to be bad. How much time do we have? Cause I want to, so we have about five more minutes. So it'd be okay. great for another point and then how people can. Okay. So the main thing, I know I was going through it, but we're going to, can have time just to read the books. Um, basically what you need to do is you need to give people knowledge. And I said to the doulas yesterday that we were teaching, I said, you think you think that you're doulas, you're only doulas. I said, you can go to the hospital, you can go to the chief of staff of your hospital and give him the information. You give him the information yes. about, about what's going on with breaches in other countries. Say, I've just come back from this great um, seminar and I found out about, about this book on breach. I found out about all these articles. Why don't we do something? And you keep telling them that. It was the consumers in our city that kept pushing women and then the women made demands and those demands are important yes the practitioners have to come around on the consumer demands so you give them the information you give them knowledge and then you start to try to normalize things and one of the ways you normalize things is you show videos. i'm going back to a seminar i'm doing it um, when i get home um, and this one I'm doing with Breach Without Borders. Breach Without Borders, thankfully, they've adopted most of the stuff that we have developed in Frankfurt. And I am really encouraging David and Rixa to move on. Um, I feel like um, um, we all might take a little, have a little nuance in how we adopt these maneuvers, but I, but I think it's really important that we all do this anywhere we are. Yes. Um, so that's what I do. I, I just you have to try to normalize breach, and that's one that's one way to do it is to to give them the knowledge show them the videos. We have to create a culture that's not fearful in order to bring these things back. Yeah. So well said. And Betty Ann, your work is just leading that charge around the world for anyone that's listening. Um, I truly hope you'll read Betty Ann's books and publish in Ukrainian now. Really? The, the Breach Books published in Ukrainian. They're picking up on it. Part of it is they never stop doing breaches. And let me hold it up again. For those of you that are listening, you can jump over to YouTube and to see it. Just such an important book, Rethinking the Physiology of Vaginal Breach Birth, Evidence-Based Guide to Upright Delivery. So where can people, one, get in touch with you? For people that are, you know, pregnant, this is so important. You can start taking on the charge, right? Finding providers in your community, and speaking up and helping to rally um, all the doulas and midwives with you. But how can people take your four-hour class if they're pregnant or doula? They can come online for sure because we do it on Zoom. Um, I only usually do it when we've got enough couples. And I, I wait for at least two or three couples to do it with. And it depends on, on the day. But they could uh, contact me. The best way is by email. Okay. Betty Ann Davis at gmail.com because I, I have a Facebook page, but I have to say I'm very bad at keeping up with it. Okay. So what we will do is if you're wherever platform you're listening or watching, that will be in the show notes. So you can cut, you'll have Betty Ann Davis at gmail.com, her email there and your other book. I just want to give a shout out because this book is so important to me. I, especially if you are a birth doula, midwife, doctor, nurse, I feel like that's essential reading, but parents, you'll really enjoy by reading as well, because I think it's so important to frame birth within the human rights and see models that really are doing it. That's part of why we're here. In yeah, it, we, what we do in this book is we have a chapter six is all about all the court cases we've won around the world, ah. but it's also got these dynamic communities that have really been able to change their world. And part of it is a focus on uh, how all of the social movements of our time are really a response to the human rights violations that were created by the colonialists because the American colonialists, the Dutch colonialists, the Portuguese, the Spanish, they all went into their, their countries. They were, they were monopolizing and, and conquering and they used genocide, slavery, 
patriarchy, violence, misappropriation of resources, and destruction of the environment in order to do it. So those six human rights violations are all being taken down today by our social movements. And I, I just realized that when I was writing the book. So yeah. that's the basis of the book. And, and Bumi Sahat is where we are in, in, um, in Bali right now. Bumi Sahat is the first chapter because I really find that Robin Lim is taking on these issues. She's not just doing, she's not just taking on birth. They do births at Bumi Sahat, but she's also taking on the importance of understanding how people in this community need to make a living. She helps people buy sewing machines so that they can start to sew, so they can start to develop um, a skill in, in, in that they can um, use to, to make their way in life. She's And she's got a whole social movement going on, the environment and yes. taking back uh, better nutrition. I mean, it's so, so example, exemplary. And that's what these other uh, chapters are to the one on Jenny Joseph and Joseph in uh, Orlando reducing the prematurity rate when nobody else in the States can do it. Right. Just by treating people with love and having continuity of care and treating people with respect. The Afghani chapter uh, is about the different ways we can approach um, places like Afghanistan, either a top-down approach or a grassroots up approach with NGOs and compares those two ways of doing it. Chapter on China is pretty amazing, given that in Beijing now, uh, there are some places where you can only get cesarean sections. And so there are some midwives that are trying to claw that back. Um, the section, the, the, the one that is most tearful in this book is the Israeli and Palestinian midwives getting across, uh, joining hands across the West Bank and joining together and actually having meetings in clandestine way. Um, so that they can help each other. This is this is definitely a book jam packed with how to, yes, how to get over those fears. Yes, and the title again for everyone, and it'll be all in the show notes, is "Birthing Models on the Human Rights Frontier: Speaking Truth to Power." And that's truly what you're doing is speaking truth to power. So thank you so much, Betty Ann, for joining us today, sharing all your incredible wisdom. I know that many people listening today will want to be in touch with you, read your books, um, and también está en español. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for joining us. Um, we always love to hear from you. So please go on our Instagram at orgasmic birth or on any of our social platforms, share your biggest takeaway today. Um, send us a message and we look forward to having you join us for the next episode of the orgasmic birth podcast. Bye.